everyone, I'm Bill, the Kids Pastor here at LifePoint, and welcome back to our Fall Harvest series here in the LP Kids Connect. Last week, as we continued our study of the fruit of the Spirit, the words, thoughts, actions, and attitudes that God the Holy Spirit wants to grow in the lives of followers of Jesus, we looked more closely at the seventh fruit that the Apostle Paul mentions in his discussion on this topic in Galatians chapter 5, that being the fruit of God-centered, Jesus-focused faithfulness. As we learned by looking at how this fruit appears in different passages throughout the New Testament, faithfulness is made up of three major parts which serve as the very heart of our relationship with Jesus and the reason that we're able to have it in the first place. First, there was our belief that God is indeed our Lord and Creator, that Jesus is our Savior and the Son of God, and that all that the Bible tells, uh, tells us about them is true. Second, there was our trust in Jesus as our Savior and as God, and in God as the ruler of our lives. That all of the promises that they've made to us throughout the Bible about what they have and will do for us as followers of Jesus are true and something we can rely on. Third, there was our loyalty to God as our Lord and Jesus as our Savior. That there shouldn't be anything more important or of higher priority to us than obeying God, avoiding sin, growing in our relationship with Him, and becoming more like Jesus in our words, thoughts, actions, and attitudes. When taken all together, then, these three parts, believing faith, trusting faith, and loyal faith, make up what we know as the fruit of faithfulness, a fruit that, when it is growing healthy and strong within us, will lead to the growth of other spiritual fruit in our lives as well. Faithfulness is the fruit that helps us to bear even more fruit. That all being said then this week, as we approach the end of our Fall Harvest series together and look at the eighth fruit that God the Holy Spirit wants to grow in the gardens of our lives, we'll be learning more about what is probably one of the least noticed of all the fruit of the Spirit, at least until it isn't present in the life of a follower of Jesus, the fruit of gentleness. Now, gentleness isn't exactly the kind of trait, uh, character trait that a lot of people look to develop in their lives in this day and age. To many successful people, like business leaders, politicians, or even famous actors or singers in Hollywood, the thought of being a gentle person is unacceptable and doesn't gel well with what most of them believe that you have to do to get ahead in life. It stirs up images of being weak, wishy-washy, unable to make decisions, or lacking the necessary self-motivated get-up-and-go that they need to see their goals become a reality. Instead, to them, the better way to live your life as you pursue your road to success is by asserting yourself, putting what you need or want before anything or anybody else, knocking down your competitors, making sure your voice is the loudest one in the room, always having a snappy, cutting comeback to the objections of the doubters and the haters, even if that means that you're not listening to anything that anyone else is saying, ignoring the roadblocks that stand in the way of your dreams, which can sometimes include your family and friends, and fighting hard to make sure that other people always agree with what you say or do, regardless of the consequences or whether it's actually right or not. If you're willing to take those steps, then, in the eyes of the world, you'll be on the right track to becoming truly successful, influential, Anything that you can dream up, any aspiration that you have, will be yours for the taking. When it comes to living life as a follower of Jesus, though, being right no matter the cost, being the loudest, being famous and influential, and ensuring that you never lose a fight with someone else, that's not what our life of faith is all about. That's not how we should treat others. And that's where gentleness comes in. Gentleness, being a gentle person, is all about being mild in our temper, humble in our attitude, uh, kind, patient, and loving in our actions, but still firm and willing to speak up when we, uh, uh, when we have to about what we know is right and good or against what we know is wrong. Gentleness isn't about being weak, but knowing how to control our passion and energy and channeling it through our words, thoughts, actions, and attitudes in a way that builds people up and doesn't tear them down. Your dreams and goals in life are important, of course, but not so important that your chasing after them should leave people hurt or broken in the process. It's good to want to have influence and to be a leader. The world needs more good leaders, but achieving that shouldn't come at the expense of ruining your reputation as a follower of Jesus or misrepresenting who the Lord is in the way we act. Being passionate about the truth and open to speaking up against what's wrong is essentially important in uh, today's society, but we can't let the certainty of our being right and righteous in Jesus cause us to lose sight of the other person, a person who Jesus loves and was willing to die for, and thus become unlike him in the process. 
We can't allow God's truth to become a baseball bat that we can use to beat into others how correct our way of thinking and living is, regardless of the harm it'll cause to them. Instead, with the help of the Holy Spirit to make our hearts more tender and compassionate, we need to come to a point, uh, point where we put the baseball bats down and, in their place, offer the person a gentle hand and our willingness to walk beside them as they seek to discover the tr uh, God's truth for themselves. In that case, then, I suppose that you could say that this uh, fruit is a sin-rejecting, people-supporting gentleness, one that loves the sinner but hates the sin, as the old saying goes. If you want a good picture of what gentleness is like in action, then look no farther than the most frequently mentioned uh, profession in all of the Bible, uh, the, the humble shepherd. A shepherd's very job description was to be a source of tender and gentle care for his sheep, someone they could rely on, living with them out in the wilderness non-stop and without regard for their own comfort or safety for months on end. Day in, day out, the shepherd watched over his sheep, guided them to green grass and cool waters to nourish them, helped them navigate through difficult terrains, and led them to places of rest and safety. If that sounds like some kind of vacation, or uh, just uh, fun in games with a bunch of fl uh, fluffy little animals, though, think again. While the shepherd needed to be gentle with their flock, they also couldn't allow themselves to drop their guard or be weak either. Uh, for instance, uh, because the very life of their sheep depended on it. For instance, if a lion, a bear, or a wolf showed up looking for an easy meal, then it was the shepherd's job to uh, defeat that beast with a staff, a sling, or whatever else they had on hand to make sure that not a single life was lost. Or if a, a thief snuck in and tried to steal one of the sheep, then the shepherd had to spring into action to chase off whoever it was that threatened the safety of his animals for their own game. Or, if one of the sheep went missing and wandered away from the rest of the flock, then the shepherd had to hit the road and travel far and wide to find his, uh, where his lost sheep had gone, so that they could rescue them from any trouble that the, might, uh, the animal might have stumbled into before it was too late. And in the process of living out this lifestyle of care, gentleness, and rightly exercised strength, the shepherd would then build a bond of trust with his sheep that would allow them to know that their caretaker was truly someone they could find comfort in and who wouldn't treat them harshly, unlike the many dangers lurking just out of sight in the big, wi uh, big wide world, waiting for an opportunity to snatch them up. And that's how it should be for us, too, when we exercise gentleness towards other people, both our brothers and sisters in Jesus, and even those who aren't, for the sake of their encouragement, the growth of their faith, and our helping to guide them out of the way of sin and danger. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, <clears throat> we see the Apostle Paul tell followers of Jesus in the city of Galatia, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not too important. Uh, meanwhile, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we see, we see him tell the believers in the city of Ephesus, Therefore I, as a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together in peace, uh, with peace. And in Colossians chapter 3, he says to the church, So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with them. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And finally, while writing to another fellow minister of the gospel, Paul says in Titus chapter 3, Verses 1 through 2. Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers, 
They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. If a follower of Jesus is going to attract the attention of others, including government officials or law enforcement, then it shouldn't be because their goal was simply to selfishly promote themselves and increase their own fame or profitability while harming the people around them in the process. Instead, it should be because of their lives of unwavering love to friends and enemies alike. It should be because of the kindness that they show in meeting the needs of others, whether they're their brothers or sisters or even strangers. It should be because of the patience that they show to those who wrong them, in order that the other person might have the time that they need to see the problems and struggles in their lives and find a better path for themselves. It should be because of the gentleness in what they say, how they approach people, and even how they correct and speak out against sin, evil, and injustice, with their ultimate purpose being to see the lives of people improved and drawn closer to God in the long run. It should be the fruit that God is growing within them that just naturally grabs people's attention and lets them know, even before they ask, that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. And speaking of Jesus himself, it's in his life and ministry to others that we see the greatest example of this kind of gentleness on, on display in all of the Bible. He is, after all, the Good Shepherd, as the uh, Gospel of John says. He sacrificed his own comfort, his own safety, and his own privileges to spend hours upon hours, day after day, sitting with people, teaching people, loving people, gently correcting people, healing people, feeding people, befriending people, and forgiving people. And not just those who the world would consider righteous or good, but those they considered sinners, scumbags, and the worst of the worst. He experienced exhaustion, stress, danger, a lack of privacy, and extreme criticism, all for the sake of showing people who God was and what his kingdom stood for. He set aside his own concerns and safely to be, uh, safety to be falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit, beaten and crucified to take the punishment that we deserve for our sins before God, all without muttering even a single unkind word or complaint to, uh, towards those who were inflicting this pain upon him. Even with dealing with his enemies, such as the religious leaders known as the Pharisees, he wasn't afraid and didn't back down from calling them out for abusing their roles as leaders and their hypocrisy and making faith in God more difficult than it should have been for the people they were teaching. But he also didn't call for his followers to begin a crusade to hunt down and destroy the Pharisees or their students. Instead, his focus was on bringing to light the sinful actions that they'd become rooted in and teaching those who would listen a better way to serve God. That's why when a Pharisee named Nicodemus approached Jesus one night out of a genuine desire to speak with him, the Lord chose to sit, spend time with, and teach him as opposed to turning his back on, ridiculing, or rejecting him because of his role as a Pharisee. And it was because of Jesus' gentle approach in dealing with Nicodemus, a man who, at another time, might have considered Jesus someone worthy of his hate, uh, that he soon thereafter became a follower of Jesus himself. Nicodemus' life was changed because of the love, the kindness, and the gentleness that Jesus freely offered to him. With that in mind, then, this week, as we go to school, interact with people online, and even hang out together here at church, Let's work hard to make sure that our words, our thoughts, our actions, and our attitudes are defined by this same kind of sin-rejecting, people-supporting gentleness that filled the life of Jesus. A gentleness that not only doesn't go easy on evil or allow wrongdoing to flourish without being addressed, but also one that values people, cares for them, and wants to see the best outcomes possible achieved for them. Healing from past harms, forgiveness of their sins through Jesus and growth and health as a believer in him after that. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I thank you that you were not harsh with us, even though we have sinned against you, even though we disobey you, dear Lord, even though we turn our backs on you at times. Thank you that you love us, that you are gentle and kind with us, dear Lord, and that you have made a way for us to be gentle and kind towards others as well. Grow this fruit more and more in our lives, dear Lord, especially in a world where it's becoming increasingly harder to see in others. And may through our gentleness, people see exactly just who you are and what your kingdom stands for, dear Lord. And may it change people's lives as we offer it to them. 
Continue your good work within us, dear Lord. Keep us all safe and well. And I just pray all of this now, and I thank you. And I thank you for everyone who's watching today, wherever they are, whether at church or at home. Just bless them all and keep them, my dear Lord. And we just pray all of this now, again, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, my friends. This week's prayer focus for families. <clears throat> pray that the Lord will help us to grow rich in sin-rejecting, people-supporting gentleness in our lives, showing love, kindness, care, and mercy to all people, no matter if they agree with us or not, while also not going easy on sin itself and allowing it to flourish. Pray that God will help us to see the areas in our lives where gentleness is being choked out by weeds, thorns, and thistles, like pride, vanity, selfish ambition, or self-righteousness, and help remove those from our hearts. And pray that as a church in this time of struggle and hardship, God can help us to live and speak in such a way that we can become even greater witnesses to the world around us of his good works and of the good news about Jesus. And finally, our family discussion questions. In your own words, describe the type of gentleness that we talked about today. What are some ways that you and your family could work together this week to allow gentleness to grow and express itself in your own lives? Read Psalm 23, and after doing so, answer this question. How do you think the words of this psalm relate to this uh, topic of gentleness, especially in regards to God's gentleness towards us? And what ways do we see sin-rejecting, people-supporting gentleness in the life of Jesus throughout the Gospels? How do you struggle with being a uh, gentle person in your own life? What can you do as a follower of Jesus to overcome these things that challenge the uh, growth of sin-rejecting, people-supporting gentleness in your life? Things like selfishness, or thinking that we're better or more godly than others in your words, your thoughts, and your actions. Is gentleness a character trait that people value these days? What types of personalities and character traits do people usually encourage us to have uh, to, to have instead, especially if you want to get ahead in life? What types of personalities and character traits do you often see in many influential people throughout our world today, such as business leaders, politicians, or actors? Is gentleness the first thing that most people uh, mention when they talk about Christians? Or are there other character traits, either good or bad, that they usually talk about first? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that Christians who are loud, angry, or controversial in a bad way are usually the ones that most people focus uh, on? And how does that affect our reputations as followers of Jesus? And that, my friends, brings us to the end of our second to last lesson here in our Fall Harvest series on the LP Kids Connect. Thank you, as always, for joining us this week. I have been Bill, the kids pastor here at LifePoint. I pray you all stay safe and stay well in the week to come. Take care of yourselves and each other. Be kind to yourselves and each other. And hopefully, I'll see you soon. And actually, have a great Thanksgiving So that's since that's coming up soon. And take care of yourselves. Enjoy time with your family. And be well. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.